And now, a 22 News COVID-19 virtual town hall with U.S. Congressman Richard Neal and James McGovern, President and CEO of Bay State Health, Dr. Mark Kerouac, Chief Medical Officer of Mercy Medical Center, Dr. Robert Roos, Chairman and CEO of Peter Pan Bus Lines, Peter Picknelly, and Superintendent of Springfield Public Schools, Daniel Warwick. Here's your host, 22 News anchor, Don Shipman. Good evening and welcome to this special broadcast of 22 News COVID-19 Virtual Town Hall. I'm Don Shipman. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed the way we live. So tonight we're joined by six guests who represent your government, the healthcare industry, our education system, and our local business community. And over the next hour here, they're gonna be here to answer your questions about the pandemic and where we stand right now and how COVID-19 will impact your future. So let's first get you kind of updated on where the state of Massachusetts stands in this pandemic right now. On Monday, Massachusetts entered phase one of Governor Charlie Baker's four-phased approach to reopening our state. So we're talking about worship, construction, manufacturing, all allowed to resume. Also part of phase one, hair salons and pet groomers, retail shops, as well as beaches, parks, drive-in theaters, and certain athletic fields were allowed to reopen. They'll be doing so in the coming days. So due to the restrictions of large gatherings, our guests are being joined remotely via Zoom. So we want to bring everyone in here. We want to start, though, with Washington and the federal government's response to the pandemic. And I want to start with Congressman Richard Neal. Uh, thanks for coming on the program here tonight. My first question is for you, because Americans really are struggling right now. The pandemic has put a, a record number of people out of work. And late last week, the House voted to pass the HEROES Act. So first, kind of talk about that bill. What's in it? Well, first of all, I think we need to acknowledge that almost 100,000 Americans have died. 36 million people as of last Friday have filed for unemployment insurance. And we attempted to tackle that through the Ways and Means Committee aggressively. We supply more unemployment insurance. There is a significant amount of money, almost a trillion dollars for state and local governments across the country. There is another hundred billion dollars for our hospitals, understanding that Two of the best ones are with us tonight, but they're on the front lines. So I think that when you consider that the, the money that we have allocated in the first four rounds, coupled with what we put on the table as of last Friday, I think this is an assertive response to the challenge that's in front of us. This is not about economic malfeasance as to what occurred in 2008. This is about an international pandemic. And until people feel as though it's safe and they have the necessary confidence to go back to the workplace, they only will do that after they believe that the coronavirus has been arrested. So I think the answer we all know is a vaccine that is not just around the corner. So adhering to the principles of social distancing, making good individual judgments, wearing face masks where it's recommended, I think all of those considerations are important. In Congress, we have now allocated, as of Friday, more than $3 trillion, which has been enthusiastically embraced by the Federal Reserve Board. And Secretary Mnuchin as well has pointed out that with the economic security paychecks that we have handed to people, that getting money into the hands of the people in the middle and lower classes for liquidity purposes and keeping cash in the system was extremely important. So my sense is that we have been proactive on this, and I assume we will reach an agreement with the Trump administration and the Republican majority in the Senate. Remember that the conversations in the last four rounds all started with our colleagues in the Republican Senate saying, we are not going to do that, only to have them end up doing it. Okay, so you mentioned that right there. Um, this includes some stimulus money for individuals and couples, families, for example. The president has said, though, that this is dead on arrival. There, uh, is there a backup plan here? I think the president has already offered the backup plan. He has said he supports the idea of more money for state and local governments. If that's the case, that'll be the magnet to draw in the other issues that many of us want to see addressed. This has been a hard time for people in the middle and at the lower end. When you consider that the $1,200 check that was sent to individual filers a month ago, that doesn't go very far. And when you consider that the unemployment rate, as I've noted, is likely to reach 20%, Moody's has estimated that 
for state and local governments that they are going to be between 20 and 25 percent down in their revenue forecasts. Right now, the growth taxes across the states, including cap gains and including sales taxes, they're in the negative arena. The result of, of which is that we, on one hand, can't say how much we appreciate those on the front lines, the first responders, and then turn around and watch teachers, firefighters, uh, police, and sanitation workers, and ambulance drivers laid off. So I think that was part of our plan. And I must tell you, it's been well met by the American people. Congressman McGovern, now your turn on this. Why is this relief package so important for your constituents? Well, uh, first of all, the need is great. I mean, we're, we're dealing with a crisis the likes of which uh, none of us have seen in our lifetime. And, uh, you know, the, my constituents, uh, for all the reasons that Congressman Neal just uh, outlined, support what we just what we did on on, on last Friday. I mean, our, our cities and towns are in desperate need. Uh, they need direct assistance uh, as well as uh, direct assistance to our state. Uh, but in the package that uh, we passed on Friday, in addition to all the things that uh, Richie Neal just said, uh, it also includes something else, and that is uh, increased funding for our nutrition uh, and anti-hunger programs. You know, um, you know, even before this pandemic, uh, we had a hunger problem in this country. 40 million of our fellow citizens didn't know where the next meal was going to come from. That has obviously been exacerbated by this crisis. What we did in this in this bill is we increased the the, the minimum. Uh, we doubled the minimum SNAP benefit. We've increased the maximum SNAP benefit by by, by 15 percent. That's the supplemental nutrition assistance program. Uh, we more money for our food banks. We 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 need to be thinking out of the box about ways to uh, not only deal with the issue of hunger but to support our farms and our restaurants. And included in this bill is a is a bill that I introduced. Uh, uh, called the Feed Act. Uh, it was inspired by Chef Jose Andres about having FEMA be able to uh, purchase some of the produce and uh, and meats from farms that right now are destroying their what they have grown. But we could purchase it, get it to where it is needed, um, and give it to restaurants and support restaurants to to prepare food for people in need. Uh, there's more money in here for essential workers for for. Uh, first responders, uh, our hospitals, our healthcare professionals, all these things are incredibly important. Uh, but look, people want us to respond appropriately and adequately to the enormity of the crisis that we face. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, I was proud to vote for the bill. Yeah, we're in a negotiation with the administration, but uh, Mitch McConnell over in the Senate has to get over this attitude of hurry up and wait. We need to do something now. Uh, and we can't wait. Uh, the need is now. And so my hope is that the pressure on the Senate to act will increase and we'll get about the business of negotiating a, a deal and getting it to the president's desk as soon as possible. You know, I think a lot of people will watch or maybe they're reading news on social media and whatnot, and they see that the, each side is so far apart. But is, is this basically how the process works? Should we not be worried right now or should we be worried? Well, don't forget, there are a number of packages that we have already passed that had uh, bipartisan support. I think in this in the bill we just passed, we only had one Republican, Peter King of New York, uh, su support us. Uh, but I think ultimately uh, we will get our Republican colleagues uh, to uh, agree to do something and, and to move to our side because, look, they, they represent uh, constituencies, constituencies like, like we do. I mean, they have people you know, who are anxious, who are, who are desperate small businesses that are worried about their viability, uh, you know, hospitals that are in need of financial assistance and uh, and need the assurance that if this crisis were to uh, come back uh, in with vengeance in the, in the fall, uh, that we're prepared. I mean, don't forget the Spanish flu that everybody keeps on referring to from back in 1918 came in waves. Uh, and it, uh, you know, so we need to, this is not over yet. Uh, and we should not be lulled into a false sense of security that somehow, you know, the worst is behind us or we can let our guard down. That's one of the reasons why I'm quite frankly horrified by the uh, reaction uh, from the White House to the science and to the medical advice that is being put forward. Uh, this is a this is this this disease should not be, uh, you know, in any way diminished in terms of its uh, in terms of its impact. This is a serious, serious uh, virus, the likes of, again, which we haven't seen in our lifetime. 
All right, Congressman, thanks for um, for the update from Washington. We're going to delve deeper into that a little bit later on, but I want to uh, go to our local hospital representatives here. And joining us tonight, we have Dr. Mark Kerouac, the president and CEO of Bay State Health, and Dr. Robert Roos, Mercy Medical Center's chief medical officer. So for weeks, Governor Baker has said that the decision to reopen our state will be based entirely on science and data. So my first question is to you, Dr. Kerouac, what is the current number of cases being treated right now at Bay State Hospitals? Well, uh, we peaked at about 180 in early April, and now for the last several days, we've been down to about 70 in our four hospitals across the system. So uh, that's more than a half reduction from where we've been, and it's been on a, uh, on a steady decline over several weeks. And then what about testing? Where do you guys stand with that? Well, we're doing about 500 tests a day. We'd like to be able to do more. Uh, we're doing enough to be able to test all of the inpatients that uh, are suspected of having this disease, people with symptoms of flu or respiratory illness uh, in the outpatient world, first responders, healthcare workers, and people who are close contacts. But we still don't have enough capacity to test anybody who's interested in being tested. And so I'd love to see our numbers go up four or five fold over what they are right now in terms of capacity. And Dr. Roos, same question for you now. Can you tell us where we stand with uh, Mercy Medical? I think we're having some audio issues there. We're trying to get that ironed out and we'll discuss that more in depth. Um, but let's, I think we have you. All right, I think we got your audio now. So where do you guys stand right now with testing? And, and case numbers. Yeah, absolutely. So our trend has followed a very similar to what has occurred all throughout the region here in Western Massachusetts, where we saw a peak of our hospitalized cases and intensive care cases in the first week of April. And then we've seen now about a two-thirds reduction in those hospitalized cases. And so at Mercy Medical Center, as of this week, our case numbers admitted are around 20 to 25, showing a significant decrease from before. And secondly, in regards to testing, the other positive sign that we've seen is week over week, the reduction in the percentage of positive tests that we've seen come back. We've now tested over 9,000 individuals. We've had over 2,200 positive tests, but we're only seeing the percentage of positive tests be between 10 and 15 percent um, now during this week. So two important signs from the science and the data, as you mentioned, right here in Western Massachusetts. And Dr. Roos, Trinity Health is also involved in clinical trials involving blood plasma therapy. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how that works? Absolutely. So one of the things about the novel coronavirus and the COVID-19 infection is that we currently don't have any FDA-approved treatments. It's been one of the areas, I think, of rapid expansion and a great, um, ex you know, uh, a great uh, increase in knowledge from the scientific community. If we think about other diseases, it would sometimes take years for us to develop treatments that could be effective. Right now, there are many, many medications and therapies that are undergoing trials to see the safety and the effectiveness. The use of convalescent plasma is something that has been around for over a century. And it has been utilized in what was brought up in the Spanish flu. It has been utilized and was shown to be effective and reduce the death rates for other coronaviruses such as SARS and MERS. In Trinity Health of New England, the regional health system that includes Mercy Medical Center is fortunate enough to be part of an FDA approved clinical trial along with a few other select healthcare systems in the country to study the use of this therapy on patients that are severely ill with COVID in our hospitals. And what we've seen with adults that are treated with it, and now we've treated dozens and dozens, are some very promising results. We've seen patients come off ventilators and be discharged from the hospital. And it's a, and it's a therapy that holds great promise, not only now, but in the future. All right, well, let's stick with treatment here because last week you both actually mentioned that Bay State and Mercy now have remdesivir. It's a drug used to treat coronavirus. So Dr. Kerouac, can you explain what that drug is and how it works? Sure, uh, remdesivir is a, uh, a, a drug that inhibits the replication of the virus, the division of the virus into uh, daughter viruses once they get inside the cell. 
Uh, it was found to, have to shorten the length of stay and reduce the number of days on ventilators of some very sick patients. And so it's been distributed across the country under an emergency use authorization. Uh, we have treated uh, roughly three dozen patients with remdesivir uh, in this last week or so, about two dozen with the convalescent plasma, and there are five or six other trials of uh, other drugs that are less well known in the press uh, that, we're, that we're doing studies on to see if those might be helpful as well. I also want to talk about antibody testing. It's now being offered in our area, and it's seen a huge response, too. Uh, Dr. Roos, um, what do these antibody tests actually do? So uh, antibody tests are really one measure to potentially find out if somebody had been infected with the novel coronavirus. The test itself is taking a blood sample and looking specifically for proteins that we call antibodies that are really made in response to exposure to some pathogen like a virus. One of the ways that they can be utilized is if somebody may have had a mild illness and did not, uh, was not tested for the virus itself in several weeks or even a month later was tested for the antibodies, it could be an indication that they were infected previously. They can also be utilized from a public health perspective to understand best the percentage of people in a community or in a population that, that had been exposed in, in what's called the, the penetrance of the infection in a community. And in some cases, um, if we know enough about these tests, it can be a representation of if somebody might be immune or might have a protection against a future infection to something. What I would caution right now is with antibody tests is depending on the test, it's essential that the test is, is of good quality, has a high what we call sensitivity and specificity to ensure that it is looking for antibodies that are targeting particularly common proteins on the virus. Because otherwise you could end up having a test that could give a number of false positives, which could be quite dangerous in a certain community. And we also don't yet know if these tests, these antibodies, really confer immunity or not. So it is, it, is a, it is an important tool in the public health armamentarium. It's something that we're doing research and looking more into how we can best utilize it going forward. All right, and I'm glad I'm glad you brought up immunity right there and um, that, and clarified that because that was actually going to be my next question. But so I want to switch gears now. And I want to talk about business, and I want to specifically talk about the restaurant business here in the local area. Um, now we're in phase one of reopening. Some non-essential businesses are reopening their doors. So we have Peter Picknelli, the chairman and CEO of Peter Pan Bus Lines. He's also the owner of several local restaurants. And Peter, I want to thank you for coming on the program here this evening. And I want to start with the restaurant industry first here because. Many restaurants have been trying to survive on just takeout alone. It won't be until June until restaurants can reopen for dine-in in the Commonwealth. And once that happens, things are going to have to change because, you know, let's face it, a restaurant like the Fort in downtown Springfield, it's, it's a big place, lots of tables, always busy. But we're talking about continuing to social distance, wearing masks for months to come here. So how do you see this impacting restaurants once they're allowed to actually reopen? Well, I think we first need to understand what will the governor's parameters be for opening, reopening restaurants. So right now it's scheduled for June 8th, um, but we need to understand, will it be full capacity? Will it be limited capacity? If it's limited capacity, um, like 25%, I think you're, you're not gonna see a, a, a lot of restaurants reopen. It doesn't make economic sense to bring staff in to open up at 25%. If, if, if restaurants are now doing a decent takeout business where staff is already there, where, the, where, uh, you know, where the cooking staff is there, prep staff, then I think you can open up with 25% capacity. I think most restaurants will need at least 50% to, to reopen. The other good thing that we're hoping happens when, when, the, when the governor opens up restaurants is that he'll allow for outside dining. That's what they've done in Connecticut. As of today, restaurants in Connecticut are, are open for outdoor dining. In Springfield, we've worked with the, the mayor and, and the city, and they're going to allow at least a student prince to close down Fort Street and open up the beer garden. So we would be able to open with outside dining in limited capacity. 
Um, all, um, all wait staff are going to be required to wear masks and gloves. I think that's going to be, you know, general practice for restaurants. Um, the kitchen staff already wears gloves, so they'll just be adding masks. So, but things will be a little bit different. Tables will be more spaced out, um, and there'll be limited capacity to begin with. But I think people are anxious to get back out and dine and uh um, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's going to happen sooner than later. It's going to be so interesting, though, to, to see your server wearing a mask. We're going to be wearing masks. And you mentioned the, the outdoor seating, allowing for more space for social distancing. And I'm wondering, too, do you think that um, restaurants will be looking to, you know, the buildings that they're leasing from, their landlords, and saying, you know what, I need more space. I'm thinking about these smaller restaurants where they're very, very small. It's very, very intimate. Are we changing the way our restaurants look because of all of this? Well, it's going to be hard to increase restaurant space for most locations, but the outside dining, um, you know, does permit restaurants to increase their space and their capacity. Again, we're going to close down Fort Street and open up the beer garden. In Connecticut, they've closed down certain streets. Uh, LaSalle Street in West Hartford is closed down, and it's going to be for all outside dining. So I think things are going to change. I think you're going to see more outdoor dining, al fresco dining, and, uh, you know, people's habits are just going to change. As example, um, menus. Um, right now, all the restaurants we have, you'll, you'll walk in, there'll be a Q, QR code on the table, you scan it on your phone, and the menu will pop up, and that's how you'll order. Uh, but at least in our restaurants, we still think the wait staff is important. They give you feedback on the menu and how the dishes are prepared. So um, certain things will change and certain things will stay the same. Um, but I think people are anxious to get out and dine. I know I am. I'm going to, I'm going to go dine out in Connecticut tomorrow. And, and that's where I was going to go next because I wonder, do you, do you really feel, do you really think that patrons will have the confidence to go out and dine, to sit inside a restaurant? I think so. I, I, I think if it's handled properly, if, if, uh, if your space up, you don't have large parties, you limit your, your parties to six or eight max, um, I think people will dine. Again, we're certainly hoping that they will. I can tell you that our restaurants in Connecticut have full reservations and, uh, you know, throughout the weekend. So I think there's a pent up desire to get out and dine and enjoy, you know, your friends and camaraderie. And that's what restaurants are all about. It's a, it's a pleasurable thing to do. And, you know, um, I think people are anxious to do so. And I know you probably don't have exact numbers, but I'm sure you're talking to your colleagues in the restaurant industry, specifically here in the western part of the state. How many of them have been telling you that they likely won't be able to reopen? If, for example, you mentioned that that 25 percent or 50 percent capacity and there being a difference there and if it's even going to be cost effective to open back up. Well, surprisingly, a number of the restaurants that I've talked to are, are doing okay with with takeout. You know, uh, it's great. We've got community support. People are coming out. You know, typical Sicilian I was at the other day, and they tell me he's doing really well. Uh, went to a restaurant in uh, in Longmeadow last night who said takeout is pretty brisk and that it's keeping their heads above water. So the community has been really great in supporting these businesses. Hopefully that continues and hopefully when they when they open, we'll have the same kind of uh, response from people in our area. All right, Peter, thank you. And coming up in the next half hour here, we're going to talk about summer travels. So we'll talk more about that. Meantime, for everyone that has children, you understand the impact this pandemic has had on education. Students have been learning remotely since March, and for some, it's been, well, a struggle. Springfield Public Schools Superintendent Daniel Warwick is here to talk about how students are learning from home. And Superintendent, uh, thanks for coming on the program. And I want to get started here with you with how things have been going and what what it's looked like since schools first closed. Well, when first school, you know, when the schools first closed, we took a look at what we could do. We were very fortunate in Springfield. We invested in one to one technology. So we had laptops for every student invested in those about five years ago and since then invested a lot in professional development for staff and uh, got the students used to using the technology 
So we were positioned, uh, a lot of the schools hadn't done a distribution, so they were taking them home. So the first thing we had to do was come out with some old fashioned work packets and we distributed them for, from 17 sites throughout the city. While we set up a laptop distribution and we've since distributed 17,000 laptops out to our students. Since then, the teachers at each school have been sending assignments and working with students using the technology. And I think we're in position to do a good job with that. It's an adjustment, it's an adjustment for families, but uh, it's going well. Not all systems had invested in technology during some tough times. We made some sacrifices in other areas and we recommended that investment in technology and Mayor Sarno and the school committee supported that. So I was grateful for that. So we're, we're, in, we're in a good position here to uh, continue uh, with services yeah. for our students. Yeah, so what kind of feedback are you getting from parents and students? I, you know, it was very funny. I was walking out of City Hall after one of our meetings um, about a week ago and one of, one of our employees approached me and he has three students. He has three kids in our school system and they have the laptops at home and they're engaged and, and they really appreciate the opportunity. Our teachers have worked very, very hard reaching out to our students and their families. And our counseling staff has been working hard to reach out to our students and families because a lot of families have some, some issues. We have some mental health issues out there in the community. So our counseling staff has done a great job also reaching out and trying to provide support. So it's a new way of working, but uh, we're embracing it. And, um, and I think our students are benefiting from it. Has there been any discussion on summer school? Is, that, is, that, so is this something that um, you're also thinking about doing remotely? A great question. We've been doing a lot of uh, research on that and working with, with my colleagues across the state. Many of us are planning on a remote summer school and in Springfield, we're gonna do our summer school remotely. We think we can serve more students more efficiently using the technology we already have distributed to our students. So in, in Springfield, we're gonna offer a remote program on the same schedule that we offered our traditional summer school but we're actually gonna be serving more students than we ever did. And you know, Springfield has actually made some really impressive improvements in recent years to raise the graduation rates. What is the school department doing to keep that going? It's gotta be a struggle um, conducting education this way remotely. It, it, it really is, it requires us working in a, in a different way, but our teams at every school are reaching out to families, making sure we engage families. During the last eight years, we've had the biggest rise in graduation rates of any uh, system in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts due to a tremendous amount of work by our staff. But that connection with students and their families is so important in reaching out and making sure we're meeting those family needs and uh, continuing that work, albeit remotely at this juncture. But, but because we had the technology and we've done so much work, it's, it's going well. Speaking of graduation, can you t talk about some of the plans for seniors? How is Springfield Public Schools going to be handling all of that? So again, I worked with my colleagues across the state and uh, we, we talked about it a great deal. I mean, senior year is so important for our students. And there's that whole rite of passage with graduation, the yearbooks, the prom, you know, the graduation ceremony. So we took a look at what we could do. It was clear. We wouldn't be able to offer a traditional ceremony. So we're, we're uh, running a virtual graduation for our students. But our families and our students were contacting the principals, contacting me at central office, looking for more. So we've set up something at every one of our schools. Very proud of my principals. But they're calling in the students one at a time. The students are gonna get awarded their diploma one at a time with their family with their cap and gown and um, actually get to take pictures on the stage at the school. You know, and again, scheduling them five, 10 minutes apart so it's safe. So we've tried to make that accommodations and our families seem to be very, very pleased with that. I thought she could be did a great job on that. And I worked with Lynn Clark on that. And I, I, I'm getting really good feedback from folks. They appreciate that effort. We're gonna offer a graduation, a virtual graduation that's gonna be on television for all of our family, same schedule, the first two weeks in June, for the graduation every night, Monday to Thursday. Focus Springfield's gonna show it on channel 15, and we're also going to use technology to blast it out. So 
Um, we're doing a great amount of work on that, but uh, we're getting great feedback from our kids and, uh, and it's gonna be safe. You know, I, one of the things I'm loving that we've been, been able to do here at 22 is to, to show video of a lot of the, the teachers and the students and the car parades and stuff like that. So it's good to see that you're finding ways to make all of that happen. Superintendent Warwick, thanks for coming on the program. We'll talk more in a bit about what to come, what's to come in September. I know a lot of people are asking about that. But now we want to talk a little bit about reopening Western Massachusetts. And I want to talk about our country as a whole as well. The CDC has finally released its detailed guidance on how to safely reopen the country, but it comes after all 50 states have begun their own strategies. The president is pushing for every state to reopen and reopen quickly. Congressman Neal now, I want to bring you back in here. Um, there's a balance here, right? I mean, unemployment is at a record high, but how do you find a balance between getting Americans back to work and keeping people safe? Well, the short answer is carefully. And if you recall that what we've done so far uh, with legislative activity, it's largely been to embrace the concepts of relief and stability. And I think that can be applied to the economic consideration as well. Now, I think that it's fair to say that the messaging has been inconsistent. And I think that on one hand, saying that we want to follow the advice of Tony Fauci, and the National Institutes of Health, which many of us happen to believe are of great credibility. These are careerists. They've done an extraordinary job and they could have done a lot of things outside of those institutions, but they decided that that's where they wanted to make their professional career mark. So I don't think that it's helpful to have conflicting messages from the administration and from the pros inside of the administration. When you consider that Right now, I think, I think Peter was correct when he said people are feeling anxious and they want to get back to economic activity. We're all learning about the process of socialization once again, how important it is in terms of exchange, the simple use of words to complete sentences to convince people that it's safe to go back to work. But if we don't provide the confidence in terms of the safety that's necessary to go back to work, you're going to find that it's going to be very difficult to convince people to go back to work. So I think that uh, every time I watch a briefing and I see Anthony Fauci, and this is something, by the way, that I outlined at the uh, Chamber of Commerce Outlook luncheon months ago, I said this was time to pay heed to the professionals, to pay heed to the facts, and to pay heed to the science of the challenge that's in front of us. So when you have these individuals who I've just described saying, embrace caution, be careful, adhere to social distancing guidelines, don't find yourself uh, on crowded beaches. There are many simple things that we can do in an individual way, I think, to acknowledge the advice that we've received from the professionals. But a more consistent message at the top would be very, very helpful. And Congressman McGovern, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think it's too early to open? Well, I have concerns, quite frankly. Um, I mean, I look, at none of us uh, want to have businesses closed. Uh, we all want to get back to as normal a life as possible. Uh, but the only thing worse than uh, being closed is opening up too soon and then having to close again. Uh, we need to listen to the medical uh, advice. We need to listen to the experts, the scientists. They need to guide us through this. Yeah, you know, we have an economic crisis, but we cannot we cannot solve the economic crisis until we get the health crisis under control. I mean, there's no shortcuts here. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm reading news articles uh, right before we went on here that Maryland opened up uh, four days ago. They've seen a major spike uh, uh, in COVID-19 cases. Uh, same, we see a major spike in in Texas. Uh, some of our some of our European uh, allies have opened up and now are, are, are shutting down partially again. And we need, to, as Richie Neal said, we need to do this very, very carefully. Uh, and um, and we need to, uh, you know, um, understand that uh, just because we're beginning to relax some of the restrictions doesn't mean that the crisis is not still real. I mean, this is real. Uh, and again, I'm worried about a, another wave. And I want to make sure that we're prepared. I want to make sure that we're uh, that as individuals and in our businesses and in our restaurants, we're we're utilizing best practices as as told to us by 
uh, the medical experts. Um, I want to make sure that um, that uh, you know that you know, we are we are preparing our hospitals uh, so that they have the necessary PPE in case we have another wave. I mean, we, uh, the idea that we that the White House dragged its feet for January, February, and March, trying to tell us that there wasn't a crisis because the president thought that somehow would mean that we wouldn't have as bad as impact on the economy. It was criminal, quite frankly. I mean, it resulted in uh, in um, more people dying and more and more chaos uh, in our response to this. So we need to be prepared. So I'm I'm concerned, um, but uh, again, I everything that I recommend uh, at this point is based on the science and on the best medical advice. But how how long can we realistically keep the economy closed? There's like we were saying before. There's there's got to be a balance, right? There has to be a balance, but again, uh, if we open up too quickly, if we open up and we let our guard down with regard to precautions, we will close back up again, and that will be disastrous. We do not want that to happen. So there is a balance here. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but I'm going to go back to what I said at the beginning and what Congressman Neal just said. Uh, we ought to be speaking with one voice here. Uh, we ought not to be hearing from our doctors like Dr. Fauci about uh you know, what we need to do and the precautions we need to take. And then hearing from the president basically saying, you know, this is much ado about nothing. You know, liberate Massachusetts, liberate Pennsylvania. I mean, you know, I mean, if, if we really want to get, get a better handle on this, we need to focus more on testing. We heard that earlier. Um, I mean, and yet for the life of me, I don't understand why the richest, greatest country in the world can't get this right why we can't just accelerate and mass produce the tests and be able to monitor this and control this virus better. Uh, it, it, it is, it is, there's, there's no good explanation for that, but that's one of the ways we can move forward with greater confidence. Okay, Dr. Kerouac, I want to I want to bring you in on this now because you sit on the governor's reopening advisory board, and you've said that you agree with the governor's approach to reopening this state. In your medical opinion, why is the state of Massachusetts ready to open now and not say two weeks ago? Well, I think it's how we're reopening and where we're at right now. Uh, the governor has insisted on a data-driven approach, that is to say, case numbers declining, deaths declining the percentage of positive tests declining over a significant period of time, and the hospitals having enough headroom that they could absorb a resurgence if one happened. And then the fact that it was stepwise, that we uh, picked industries and sectors that were not likely to uh, create large crowds, uh, and uh, really just to, to let those come on, things like construction and manufacturing, where they're able to separate. These places are not coming back like they did three or four months ago. Uh, and I think that is the big risk, as Congressman McGovern says. I, I saw a video of a big party out in Colorado Springs with hundreds of people not wearing masks and uh, near some river someplace. It's crazy to think that people can resume that kind of activity. But if we go back to limited activity and follow the social distancing, the masks, the hand washing, the disinfection, uh, I think we can take a stepwise approach and we'll know if we've gone too far because we'll see a blip up in the cases. Uh, and that's where the ability to test and contact trace and contain the little brush fires is so important. All right, we do have some viewer questions here. This one is coming from Sherry via social media. And she asks, we talk a lot about the new normal, face masks and social distancing. How long do you think that we're going to have to wear these masks and until we find a vaccine? I think that it's likely we are going to need to wear them until there is a safe vaccine that can be widely available. Uh, almost like the measles vaccine is today, so that the great majority of people have antibody that's effective in giving immunity. That may well be another year, a year and a half, uh, because there's no guarantee that every step of the vaccine development is going to go smoothly. I know there's been some good news this week, but that's a long ways from saying that the vaccine is safe and can be given to millions or billions of people. And Dr. Ruth, I'd like to get your medical opinion on this as well. Yeah, I think that we are in this for the long haul. There, this is not going to be something that changes anytime soon. The effectiveness 
of the strategies that we put into place to help flatten the curve are unquestioned. And that means that we must continue them for the, for, you know, for the future until there is a solid vaccine. So wearing masks in public, continuing the physical distancing and the, you know, and the deliberate uh, and vigilant hand hygiene is gonna be essential for many, many months, if not years. And we also have this viewer question. This one is coming from Julie. She wants to know when elective surgeries will resume. And we'll start with you, Dr. Roos. Well, this has been something that uh, the Governor Baker and the Department of Public Health have given some specific advice on. Right now, we are uh, in the Commonwealth underneath an emergency order that prohibits elective non-essential procedures through the end of May. Uh, one of the important aspects of the four-phased approach to reopening um, gave specific guidance to hospitals regarding the types of procedures and studies um, that are able to be performed. And we expect that as hospitals will be able to attest to a number of different criteria that uh, ensure that there is adequate capacity in our system to be able to treat COVID and non-COVID illness, that there are adequate care safeguards, including COVID-free zones like we have here at Mercy, and adequate testing and personal protective equipment that will be able to bring in more types of procedures and studies along the way. As a, as a physician and, and as a healthcare a leader here, one of the things that has concerned me uh, about this is that there are people that we know that are delaying medical procedures and studies and visits that could have a negative impact on their health. We've seen dramatic declines in emergency department volume for things like chest pain and abdominal pain. We've seen procedures delayed now over a month or six weeks. And in some cases, the surgeons are saying to their patients, you know, this could have negative impacts if we aren't able to move forward soon. So this is the type of thing that right now as hospitals and healthcare systems, you know, we are looking to uh, collaborate um, with the Department of Public Health and move forward cautiously with the right type of monitoring when the time is right. And Dr. Kerouac, let's go to you now with those elective surgeries. I mean, is there a, I didn't hear a date. I, I feel like people want to know if there's a specific date, like June 8th, we can start this, or June 10th. And I'm going to guess that we don't have a, a true date just yet. Yeah, well, in healthcare, like, uh, it's, it's even grayer than that, because as Dr. Roos said, if uh, an individual has a chronic condition or is a vulnerable kind of patient who would be doing worse if they had to wait, uh, we are allowed to go ahead. For the things where it, it wouldn't make a difference in the outcome to wait several weeks, uh, then we have been asked to wait. Uh, I'm going to guess that uh, the, the time between the various phases is at least three weeks, according to Governor Baker, and he's going to want to see continued improvements in that same sort of data I mentioned earlier for us to really open the, uh, the door to doing purely elective surgery, let's say cosmetic uh, plastic surgery, for example. All right, let's talk about reopening schools. People are already talking about what's going to happen in the fall. So Superintendent Warwick, it may be too soon to even know right now, but will kids be back in the classroom come September? Well, that's a great question. I mean, we're already meeting with the commissioner and superintendents across the state and talking about reopening schools. Obviously, we're gonna have to follow the science. We're lucky here in Springfield. Dr. Kerouac and Dr. Roos have been advising the mayor's team weekly, and we're trying to follow the science on this piece and see what's appropriate and when. So I, I think a phased in reopening will occur, but we're gonna have to watch to see how these the rates of infection go and really monitor this. But certainly we're not going to, um, you look at buses, sometimes we have almost up to 60 students on a bus or 25, 30 students in a classroom. I think we're, we're a ways from being able to open like that. So talking about perhaps a phased in opening in the fall, but we have some months to plan that and we're, we're gonna follow the science as, as we make those plans. And I, and I know that some schools, or I should say colleges, universities are looking at the fall as well. They're talking about shortened semesters, for example. And you mentioned that phased opening. Maybe, uh, what are the discussions surrounding a phased opening and what does that look like possibly? possibly. There's been discussions like a week A, week B, bringing half the students back and then alternating weeks, continuing the remote learning um, 
or you know every other day those kind of things or and you know some looking at um more remote learning to begin with so looking at all of our options and see what the infection rates look like and then follow the the science of this thing and proceed cautiously so we're not endangering our kids and then i you know i i'm just envisioning children walking around school or out on the playground if they are at the school and then wearing face masks would they be required to wear a face mask is that something that's being discussed right now too certainly looks like it if if we return to school live in uh, late august early september that we're people are still going to be wearing masks. So we're going to follow all the safety protocols that are recommended at that time. And we mentioned social distancing, but is there enough space in our schools to actually have adequate social distancing? Well, you, you know, you, you brought up a good point. You know, I mean, our classrooms were built for, you know, class sizes of 20 to 25. Obviously, you know, your average classroom, you're not going to be able to put 25 students in there at a time until things change rather dramatically. So we're talking about, uh, you know, a phased in reopening and, and uh, you know, uh, looking at like a week A, week B cycle or every other day for students and having half as many kids in the classroom where we could appropriately socially distance. I want to bring back uh, bring back in Peter Pignelli now um, to talk more about the transportation aspect of all of this. You're the CEO of Peter Pan Bus Lines. So what are some of the safety measures that you've taken to protect, one, your staff, and then also passengers on the bus? Well, let me just, can I back up a bit? Because I take a little bit different approach than some of the other guests here. Um, from a business person's point of view, I, I, I agree there needs to be a balance act, but I think you can do both. I think people are smart and people running good businesses are smart. If customers are comfortable, they'll come back. If businesses are smart, they'll, they'll, they'll put together procedures that make people feel comfortable so that they'll want to return. I think you can be safe and open up the economy at the same time. As it relates to the bus line, we're gonna begin service again on June 5th. We're looking at advanced sales and we're seeing some activities from mid from mid June on. Um, as it relates to safety procedures and protocols, all passengers will be required to, to wear masks to, to board the bus. Um, we have purchased, you know, state of the art, you know, uh, fogging devices that, you know, thoroughly disinfect and, you know, sanitize and, and kill all viruses on board the bus. So that'll be done every single night. We've also purchased these sealant products that, um, that, that, that are sprayed on the interior of the vehicle that, that state of the art that's used in certain police cars nationwide, but are, at, will be the first commercial vehicle in the country to use it. And, um, and it's, it's sprayed across the entire interior of the vehicle and it seals the, the, the vehicle and that all bacteria and viruses are killed on contact and, and can't stick to it. So, you know, we've taken what we think a reasonable protocol and procedures to make sure that our customers feel comfortable traveling again. Um, our drivers will be required to wear, um, you know, uh, 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 masks and, uh, you know, some may wear gloves, but uh, some may choose not to because they're not comfortable driving with them. Do you think, though, that your customers are going to be willing to sit next to a stranger? That's very close proximity. That is not social distancing. So how would you operate the bus in that sense? Well, um, yeah, I, I think certain people, yeah, I think people are going to travel again. Um, you know, um, the passengers sitting on the bus next to them will be required to wear a face mask. And, uh, you know, I, I believe that people are going to travel again. They, you know, they, 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 many people need to. They need to travel to, to get to uh, medical appointments. They need to travel, uh, uh, you know, to visit loved ones and to see family members, to go to school. So, you know, we provide a very vital service. In many cases, our customers don't have a car or choose not to drive. So, 
Um, we're, in, we're a necessary form of transportation that connects people to, to schools, to hospitals, to medical appointments, and to work. There's been a lot of talk about a possible second wave or even a third wave. And I want to bring back the doctors now to discuss this a little bit further. Um, health experts insist that a second wave of COVID-19 will in fact happen. So Dr. Kerouac, is Bay State Health ready for this? We're ready for it. I, I don't think anybody is certain about it. There are a lot of people who believe it's going to happen and a lot of people who are not quite sure and a lot of people who are sure it's not going to happen. Um, we are certainly ready, and one of the things that is uh, a criteria for any of us reopening our doors for elective surgery is that we have 30% excess bed capacity, both in terms of regular beds as well as ICU beds, if there is a resurgence. Um, we hope there's not. A lot of it really depends on us, depends on the extent to which we follow these preventive measures of hand washing, social distancing, wearing masks, et cetera. I think if we can, as a, as a community, come together and do that, we can prevent a resurgence. So I don't think it's guaranteed by any means. And I wanna, I wanna follow up on something we talked about with restaurants and the space that restaurants are in. So Dr. Kerouac, are hospitals looking at the possibility of having to rethink the design of a hospital in the sense of how many beds they have, uh, like the capacity they have? Well, hospitals have been taking care of patients with serious infectious illnesses for generations. And so it is no news to us to uh, deal with a novel infectious agent because it tends to follow patterns like other infections we've taken care of before, influenza, TB, hepatitis, AIDS. Um, and so we really are drilled in the ability to apply precautions. As Dr. Ruth says, when there's a large number of people with a new infection, we, can, we tend to put them in a certain area of the hospital and reserve other parts of the hospital for folks who don't have it. Uh, and that kind of segregation is part of the infection control. Uh, and so I, I think this, this is something that is part of our, all of our basic training and has been for generations. As you know, I, I practiced for over 20 years in the HIV and uh, AIDS era, and uh, much of this seems quite familiar in terms of uh, the procedures that we're using. Definitely a lot of parallels there. Dr. Roos, would you say that hospitals are more prepared for this second wave uh, because of what we are learning from the, the beginning of this whole pandemic? Absolutely, without question. You know, in, in Mercy Medical Center and the Sisters of Providence before that really have a legacy of transforming how we meet the community's needs. And we've all talked this evening about how we've transformed what we've done to meet the community's needs. This is just another example of that. We've transformed our hospital uh, to be able to take care of patients with COVID and infectious disease and patients without COVID and infectious disease literally getting down and creating COVID-free entrances, COVID-free walkways, elevators, and entire floors for patients. And so we are prepared now to take care of patients with infectious diseases like this, and it has well prepared us to go into a second phase or an unknown pandemic if one were to strike in the future. We're here for you, and we've got safe care for everyone. All right, Congressman Neal, to you, is Washington ready for a second wave? Well, I hope so. I hope the experience that everybody's witnessed here would make sure that we understand that the role that the supply chain plays in terms of international economics, I think that the supply chain where you become dependent upon uh, Europeans or you become dependent upon uh, Asian nations for basic issues like uh, protective equipment, I think we've learned a painful lesson about that. I think there are some agencies that were sidelined along the way for cost-cutting purposes. So I think that uh, understanding what the pandemic has done to our national psyche is important as well. I think that uh, the lessons here, have, I hope for the takeaway, is that the long-term investment that we've made, for example, in the National Institutes of Health has been worth it. The investment that we've made in, the two doctors would know this, what is known as graduate medical education mm -hmm. is worth it. What we've done in terms of the allocation of dollars in terms of the public purse for the Centers for Disease Control, it's worth it. And pairing back these institutions in the sake of budgetary constraints doesn't make any sense. 
you have Bill Gates, and I talked to Melinda Gates the other day. She was help, helping to provide some advice to me as we were writing some of this legislation. Bill Gates is one of the few voices in America that was warning about a pandemic. So I think that the professionals here are the ones that we should pay adherence to in terms of advice. But I am going to propose using a lot of basic tax incentives to bring back some of that manufacturing that departed because we didn't think that we could ever be affected by a pandemic. Congressman Neal, thank you. And I wanna thank each of our guests here this evening for being here and answering your questions about the COVID-19 pandemic. I wanna thank our viewers as well who sent us questions. If you did miss any of this broadcast, you can rewatch it in its entirety, all at our website right now at www.lp.com, also the 22 News mobile app. And for all of us here at 22 News, have a good night.